In the last video, I talked about how there's this interesting problem of factorization, where you take a number and figure out how you can decompose it into its factors such that the product of those factors yields the number that you were interested in in the first place. And it seems like this problem of factorization is a hard problem where, where no one really knows an efficient solution for being able to, to decompose a number to factor it efficiently. Even though the inverse problem of factorization, the multiplication problem, is a very easy problem to solve, okay? especially on a computer. A computer can really take two digits that are, or two numbers that are a thousand digits each and multiply them together in a fraction of a second. And yet given the product of two 1,000 digit numbers, uh, it's possible that a computer may never figure out the constituent factors for, for many millions of years, even the fastest computers using the best known techniques that we are aware of today. Okay. Now you might be wondering, given all this, why people even care about this, this factorization problem in the first place? Why do people even want to come up with a factorization of a number? And it turns out that this particular one-way function, this particular one-way function of of multiplication and factorization, okay, it turns out to have very, very important uses in practice. And uh, one of the uh, most well-known uses of the this multiplication factorization phenomenon uh, is a crypto system that's used in practice, known as the the RSA crypto system. Okay, RSA, and it actually is, is one of the most common systems for encrypting and safeguarding your data. And it's based on the idea, and this is a little bit loose, I'm not going to be very mathematically precise here, it's basically based on the idea that, that multiplying two numbers to derive their product is easy, but finding uh, constituent factors, or the constituent factors given the product, appears to be difficult. Okay. Actually, the RSA is, is predicated on a slightly more specific problem than factorization, but if factorization turned out to be easy, then it turns you could actually break RSA. Now, RSA is a very, very important cryptographic system. It's actually used uh, within a lot of major websites. So for example, when you go to a site like Amazon.com or Google or Facebook or really any major site where you have to enter in a, a password or even a credit card number, and you see that on the web page, sometimes you might see something like a, uh, uh, when you look at the web page, it might say HTTPS. Okay, or you might actually see uh, a lock icon on the web page. Okay, on that particular web page, when you see that web page in your browser, the security of your data, in that sense, is resting upon this RSA algorithm. And the RSA algorithm, in turn, relies on the hardness of factoring. And it relies on it in the sense that if factoring were easy, then RSA could be broken. If RSA could be broken, then somebody could potentially decrypt the uh, encrypted payload that's transferred over HTTPS, and that encrypted payload might include things like a password or a credit card number, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So hopefully that, that gives you some sense of, of the magnitude of, of the importance of the factorization problem. In fact, uh, if you want to try to make some money, uh, you, what you might want to do is you might want to go to Google and, and type in the, the RSA uh, factoring challenge the RSA Factoring Challenge, and that's actually going to take you to a web page uh, that is set up by the uh, the makers of RSA. Actually, it's a company called RSA Security, which is now a division of EMC uh, Corporation. And basically, RSA Security commercialized the RSA crypto system. And if you go and type in RSA Factoring Challenge, you'll be given to a web, you'll be taken to a web page rather that has a list of numbers, and the company, RSA Security, this division of EMC, will actually pay you literally tens of thousands of dollars for each one of these numbers that you can factor into its constituent factors. And they're not short numbers. They're typically maybe hundreds or even thousands of digits long. Uh, so you will have your work cut out for you. Okay. And some of these numbers, actually some of the smaller ones, have been factored in the past. And typically, they've been done, um, even though factoring is a very difficult problem, they have been factored by basically harnessing the power of literally tens of thousands of computers on the internet, okay, to, to be able to factor these, these relatively modest sized numbers. But some of the larger numbers in the RSA factoring challenge have not yet been factored, okay? And I think RSA runs these challenges in part because they have a vested interest 
in understanding the progress made on the factory in problems. They really want to encourage progress. They want to encourage people to analyze factoring uh, with the thought process that if factoring is indeed a hard problem, then their crypto system is secure. So they want people to have confidence that factoring is a hard problem. And what better way to have confidence that a problem is hard than enticing people to try to solve it and showing that nobody was able to do so. Okay? Now I think this 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 aspect of uh, the seeming intractability of, of factoring, this idea that it's a hard problem to solve, seems to have some very surprisingly positive implications. And it actually enables things like electronic commerce. And so it, it's kind of ironic that the fact that there's this problem out there that's hard to solve, well, that's not necessarily a bad thing. There's actually some kind of a positive way to spin it because you can do things that, that really leverage the hardness of this particular problem. Okay. Now, the factorization problem also has a very intriguing property, another intriguing but related property, and that is that if someone tells you the answer, you can verify it really easily. So for example, and I mentioned this in the previous video, I took, asked you uh, if you could factor the number 174,661. Again, this is the kind of number which, which might be hard for you to factor uh, manually, but with a computer it's actually pretty trivial, and um, if you were to write a computer program that did something as simple as trial division, in a very short amount of time, probably in a fraction of a second, it would spit out the factors 389 and 449. And indeed, if you multiply 389 and 449 together, you'll notice that their product is equal to 174,661. Okay? And in fact, you don't even need a computer to verify this. If you just multiply these two by hand, you could fairly quickly tell that the answer was correct. Okay, now this idea, this, this concept of problems for which someone can really help guide you to the answer efficiently, and to be maybe a bit more precise, uh, by efficient I mean in polynomial time, well these types of problems are part of a class of problems known as NP, and NP stands for non-deterministic polynomial time. Okay, and they, I, there actually are some reasons for this nomenclature of non-deterministic polynomial time, and I'm going to write that down because I hear a lot of people um, talk about NP like it's non-polynomial time or something else that's convoluted. But what NP actually stands for in the context of the P versus NP problem is it stands for uh, non-deterministic non-deterministic polynomial time. Okay, and uh, you might be wondering where this nomenclature comes from, and I won't go into elaborate detail, but I'll basically indicate that. Uh, uh, non-deterministic polynomial time refers to really the amount of time it takes to solve this problem on what's called a non-deterministic Turing machine. Uh, and a Turing machine is really just a model of computation, and it's a model of computation that's, that's a bit more abstract in nature, but it gives you the same computational power as a typical computer. And so I won't go into details on what that means, uh, but suffice it to say actually that, that, that in general, the class of problems that's solvable in non-deterministic polynomial time can be expressed uh, quite precisely and mathematically as those decision problems for which a yes answer, so let me actually write that down so it's more clear, they're, they're basically decision problems, uh, decision problems for which a yes answer can be verified easily. Okay? Yes can be verified easily. Okay, in other words, um, can I verify a yes instance in that decision problem easily? And by verify, what, what I really mean here, I mean that uh, there is something like uh, an efficient, uh, an efficient proof, okay, an efficient proof or an algorithm, and, and an algorithm has to be a series of steps which we know to be correct. We may need a proof that the algorithm is correct as well, but really an efficient mechanism, a proof for verifying that the yes instance is indeed the correct answer. And maybe I should give you some intuition here. It's kind of like if you've ever played the game, you know, Where's Waldo, or maybe the game I Spy. You know, if someone showed you um, a Where's Waldo picture and asked you to find Waldo, then you know you you may or may not succeed in finding Waldo. But regardless of how hard Waldo was to find, if that person then showed you where Waldo was, you would be able to ascertain or verify that indeed. That was Waldo, and you could do that pretty easily by, by knowing what Waldo looks like. I mean, like you likewise, if you're playing a game like I Spy, you know, and you couldn't find the picture in question, like you couldn't find the, the green marble or whatever it happens to be. 
but someone showed you where that particular item was in the picture, uh, then you could very easily verify the answer. So now you actually understand what NP stands for. It stands for problems that, uh, that references decision problems where the yes answer can be verified easily. and I gave you some intuition around that uh, by, uh, by describing, the, uh, by describing this, this, uh, this factoring problem. Uh, and moreover, uh, the P part of P versus NP we know stands for polynomial time. And so now you actually understand the basics behind what the P versus NP problem asks for. The P versus NP problem can really be stated as follows. Is the class of problem that can be solved with polynomial time algorithms identical identical to the class of problems that can be solved with non-deterministic polynomial time algorithms. And it's not just enough to have a belief or a sense one way or the other. To really solve this P versus NP problem, you need to be able to produce a rigorous mathematical argument, a mathematical proof that can substantiate your belief. Okay, so now that you know what this problem is, I'm going to end this video right here. In the next video, I'm going to talk some more about this P versus NP problem. And, and down the line, we'll talk about some approaches for being able to reason about P and NP.